Confirming, I am recording, testing, I am testing my recording, and here we go. Here we go in three, two. Everybody, it's the All In <laughs> Podcast. Wet your beak, young Spielberg, your coming beak. at you on a Friday <laughs> morning, beak. afternoon draft time. The number 11 podcast in the world. It's the All In Podcast with the Queen of Quinoa, David Friedberg, Rain Man himself, with his hot new track from Young Spielberg. I am the Rain Man, David Sachs, and of course, wetting his beak, the Absolute dictator, wetting his beak with his merch. Merch game is strong. Chamath, Polly, Hapa, Tia. How's everybody doing on the backs of us becoming the number 11 podcast in the world? Really good. Really, really wow, good. Wow, look at that enthusiasm. <laughs> really great. No, I think we had an intermittent... Uh, 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 Saxipu is not apparently, you know, with with all these, with all his week uh, beak wetting, he hasn't had time to pay the internet bill. <laughs> yeah, hey guys, I'm back. You can go ahead and upgrade your DSL from <laughs> from 56 kilobits. I think you can afford it. Okay. He's hit his bandwidth limit because he was watching himself on Tucker over and over again this morning. <laughs> so I'm, he, sorry, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, 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 I do. I do need to say this that yesterday we do have firsthand evidence that David Sachs, after appearing on Tucker Carlson, then spent the next hour watching himself <laughs> appear on Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Literally got up from the poker table. My God! Refused to play poker with his besties because he had to watch himself on no less than six times on Tucker. Oh my yeah. gosh. No, it, it must have been, it must have been watched it 20, times. 30 times. No, no headphones, just listening to the iPhone, looking at it. No, yeah, this, holding this it is, up to his ear just so he doesn't yeah. miss a word, optimizing his performance. What was it like to go on Fox News? Was this a dream for you, Sax? Is this a, is this a bucket list? <laughs> See, Jason, this is why you're such a scumbag because <laughs> I, I asked you guys, I said, hey, like the uh, Tucker Show's invited me on. Should I go? You know? Yes. And, and and you guys are like, yeah, yeah, it'll be great for ratings for the pod. You should definitely do it. And then after I do it, the first thing you guys say when I walk in the room is, oh, my God, you went on Tucker? How, how right wing are you? Do you realize that all your deal flow just got canceled? Yum, yum. I'm going to get all your deals out. And, and by the way, that was the funniest part. Jason had premeditated totally. basically <laughs> getting you to appear on Tucker so as yeah. to impugn you and destroy you. Totally. Yeah, Jake out goes, oh, I'm going to get all your deal now, yum yum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all is fair when it comes to early stage deal flow. Yeah, and then yeah. he starts tweeting. You know, he's like the first one to show a photo of me split screen with Tucker. And <laughs> it's like sure I was every- waiting. I was waiting. I was literally watching time, it. And it's the time for the was, great takedown. Yeah. Actually, you did. In all seriousness, you did great. Um, I think it was worth doing. And he framed it as I don't know if people saw it. You can look up Tucker Carlson. Bestie, David Sachs, it'll come up number one. And um, he said you were um, essentially taking a very liberal, classic liberal point of view. So he basically set the stage for you to not be a far right wing nut case. You were actually defending liberal principles of people should have the ability to have freedom of speech. Why don't you talk about what it was like? Yeah, I mean, so so you're right. I mean, he made the the connection and the comparison to Net uh, Hentoff, who was like the famous ACLU free speech lawyer, and uh, and I really appreciated that because I do very much see myself in that mold of uh, of somebody like Hentoff. Um, he wrote a book called uh, "Free Speech for Me, but Not for Thee," um, sort of a famous line uh, because everybody wants free speech for themselves and their allies, but they want to deny it to people they disagree with. And, you know, they never seem to realize that censorship is a problem until it gets turned against them. And so, you know, the point I made about the, these Reddit kids who are censored is that, look, this, this was not, well, they, there was some raunchy speech in their message board. Uh, we all know that, but it was no different than any trading floor, or trading pit or, or boiler room on Wall Street, right? It's the same kind of language. Yet they were taken down and censored by Discord for, for hate speech. Why? Because they became very threatening 
to, you know, powerful insiders. And, um, you know, but how many of those, those Reddit kids uh, saw it as a problem when, you know, Trump or his supporters got or, or Parler got deplatformed a few weeks ago, they could never have imagined that that same censorship principle could ever get turned against them. And, um, and so we all have a blind spot to, towards censorship when we like the results. And, you know, Hentoff's point is always, look, it's not about the results. It's about who are you giving the power to, to, to censor to? And that's what you have to be really careful of. In relation to that, how delightful has it been to not have Trump on Twitter putting aside, you know, censorship, even for you? As a Republican, uh, conservative, but liberal socially, I will note, uh, you're very liberal socially, you're live and let live, uh, pro LBGTQ, of course. Uh, and, and, but to not have Trump on Twitter has been all that cognitive space has come back. We get it all back. S- silence, right? s- silence is, is, is bliss. Uh, silence what did you guys think? What did you guys think about, the, um, what is her name? Marjorie blah 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 Green, who just got completely <laughs> censored. What what exactly happened? Yes, Sachs, is that censorship? Yeah, if you're a crazy loon who believes that <laughs> parking Q-Anon. shooting was a false flag, what do we do there? No, I mean Sachs? that's not that's not censorship. It's just she got censured, I guess, um, because her colleagues thought she was out of line. So, mm-hmm. That's okay. I mean, if her colleagues want to vote for that, that's fine. So she can um, still say crazy stuff. She just can't do it and have this certain job. Yeah. I mean, look, let, let's face it. When, when politicians say crazy stuff, it helps the other side. I mean, you know, Marjorie Green or whatever, her censorship, who does that help? It helps the Democrats. Um, you know, quite frankly, uh, does Trump being off Twitter, uh, does that really help the Democrats? I don't think so. I mean, um, you know, you could argue that that Biden or, or or that Trump is the one unifying opposition to Trump is the one unifying force in the Democratic coalition. So to, to the, the the more Trump is out there, the the more it bonds the Democratic coalition together. Um, so yeah, I mean, censorship has this way of like backfiring, and uh, you can't just look at it in terms of narrow short term political results. Speaking of censorship, I want to get your take on something else. I think. These last two weeks have been a complete sea change in venture capital. And let me give you the setup. It's all of a sudden seemed like um, there's been a decision that's been made where the ecosystem of companies will basically use their own platforms and their own mediums to completely control the narrative and the dissemination of information about them, that the media in the effort of company building um, may have taken a big step back. Um, you know, I think uh, the whole sort of like thing on Clubhouse was really interesting. I think uh, this guy who just joined Andreessen Horowitz, um, who actually hosts a show on Clubhouse is really interesting. Um, I think there's some like really interesting emerging managers who just have these incredibly different ways of- Sri Ram is his name. Um, Sri Ram, He's been hosting right. Good Times at 11 11- 10 or 11 p.m. every yeah. night on Clubhouse. Mark Andreessen comes to it every night. And of course, Elon came, interviewed Vlad. And then last night, Zuckerberg showed up uh, in order to get the blueprints for Clubhouse to then put it into <laughs> <laughs> Instagram and Facebook. But what do you guys what do you guys think of sort of like this entire sector of the economy basically trying to, I guess, organize an end around it, it's, I don't know uh, traditional it's just, media? It no, doesn't no, no. seem like it's just venture, right? I mean, look at look at Trump. You know, he avoided having the traditional press conference as the the, the channel for dissemination of his point of view and communication of his uh, objectives. And he went on Twitter every day and he just tweeted. Um, and I think, you know, anyone who's been part of a business or an operation that's had to deal with, you know, media gathering facts that uh, that you don't consider to be true and you can't really counter their point and then they publish and it's static and it's out there, um, you're frustrated. And in, the, in the, the world that we have today, which is many alternatives for going direct to our customer and going direct to our audience through social media and having control over that message, uh, it's appealing to make the switch away from traditional PR and going to social. I mean, Chamath, you don't put out press releases. You go on Twitter and you make a, a statement about what your intentions are and you publish I, your one pagers. And I feel like everyone's trying to do this. And there's all this like trend at big companies now too, which is how do you develop a quote unquote social media presence? So you can speak directly to your audience and your customers without having to go through the press. I find it very so. hard um, to get 
the point across um, by going through traditional media. Right. It's not that it's not that it can't be done, but I find it harder and harder. And the reason is because they're in such a ferocious competition with social media, and so they have to be just as click oriented and newsworthy totally. totally. um, as the next best tweet that's that's trending at that time. So it's it's that an almost impossible right. task. Well, Naval Naval had a great line about this, which I think he tweeted a long time ago, which is that the internet commoditized the reporting of facts, and so at that point, the the traditional media went wholesale into Opinion. opinions into opinions and so now they all have an agenda of some totally. kind and especially the tech press their agenda basically is hatred of tech i mean they right. hate the people they're reporting on i mean jake how you know this right i mean yeah i mean I, having been a journalist in this I, it's really interesting to hear your opinions and if you look at trust among uh republicans all-time low uh in the press, and then just all Americans don't trust the press right now. They think there's hidden agendas, and it really is a confluence of events. What happened was the internet caused um, the revenue streams of the press to get just violently compressed or eliminated. So, you know, you had Craigslist take the classified business, Google and Facebook took the ad business in subscriptions, Netflix, Spotify, et cetera. So you have all that revenue is gone. And what that meant was they... Uh, didn't have the resources to do fact checking. And then the publishing schedule because of blogging, which I was involved in, required that people file two, three, four times a day just to keep up. And so when you're filing even just twice a day, there is no time to get quotes from the subjects. So we have all as people who are subjects had quotes uh, attributed to us that we're like, where did you pull that quote from? I'm like, oh, three years ago, you said this or whatever. And then you don't even know you're going to be in the story. Like the hit piece they did on you, Chamath, some sports writer in SF Gate did some hit piece on Chamath. Did they ever call you? Did they ever say, would you like to respond no. to us? That's how it used to work. That's what, you, that's what you learn when you get a degree in journalism, right? You call the subject, you interview. Of course. And it used to be check. you filed once every two weeks, or maybe if you were in a weekly news, a news, like a news week or a business week, you filed once a week. Magazines, you filed once uh, or twice per episode, per issue, or maybe once every other issue or feature writer. Now they have to they have to publish so much. By the way, Jason, you they said don't something. Don't do any fact checking. You said something really, really important. It's the craziest thing where these guys will not even call you and say, "Here's what we're running," or "Here's what we're going to say." Do you want to work through this with us? Do you want to tell us? Are there any inaccuracies? We're yeah. really seeking the truth. Nobody's really seeking the truth. They're seeking and, clicks. Yes, and, and so, so here's what happens. Yeah, the your salary is now determined by your number of followers on Twitter as is your book deal. And your sub stack then becomes your negotiating position versus your existing publication. So someone like Kara Swishers, who is not full time at the New York Times probably makes a half million or a million dollars a year doing her podcast with them in the editorial page, I, I would say somewhere between 500k and a million. All the other writers there are looking at other people who've gotten significant followings and saying, I have to get a big following. How do you get a big following? Well, Sachs figured that out. He he wasn't didn't have a huge following on Twitter in the last couple of months, but since we did the podcast, Sachs started having an opinion and picking a side and really owning his opinion. And what and, happened? And, but in fairness, Massive and also engagement. being super and super intelligent and thoughtful about it, of course. But anybody picking a side gets rewarded, and if you go down the middle, you don't get rewarded. Because people go, that makes but, sense. But, but then I think that people, outraged. then people should just be using facts as a jumping off point, as opposed to like weaving it into the narrative so that other folks get confused. Meaning, you know, it used to be the case that a newspaper has an opinion page. Well, no, now the whole newspaper is opinions. Correct. Because yes. the facts you can just get from the AP, right? right? Like there's there's no point calling the New York Times to figure out what the hell is really going what on in the world. they should be doing is deep analysis. Yeah, like that New York Times article that you brought up a couple of weeks ago, Chamath, that we talked about on the pod was uh, about the, the the trust fund kids who are giving away all their money. You know, it wasn't an analysis of how many people with this amount of wealth are giving away their money. It was anecdotes to make the case that this is the storyline yeah. that they kind of wanted to, to progress. And, you know, that is, I think, the where you're able to kind of stay within the bounds of traditional journalism but still, you know, get a narrative across that is a bit sensational and, and it is a bit kind of, you know, inspiring. And Freeberg, all you need to do, having been on the inside of these discussions, is when you have one person, it's a profile, as an example. When you have two, um, it's still a kind of a profile with an example. But once you get to three, you got a trend piece. 
And so yeah, what and, your editor say to you is, if you can get me a third person who's a trust fund kid, now we got a trend piece and we're in the clear. So let's do that and do the anecdotes instead of actual research, which then takes time and resources. And if you look, what Andreessen Horowitz has specifically done with Clubhouse is, and it's really freaked out some New York Times reporters, I won't say which ones, because every time I mention this one reporter, she pulls the female reporter card. And she pulled it last night where she said, I'm a female oh, reporter. Taylor, Taylor Lawrence. Mark and Dreesen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to say who it is because she Taylor, gets really Taylor, upset. No, 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 it's Taylor Lawrence. But she, I mean, she, yeah, she tweeted it. So I don't think yeah, she's so she, hiding from it. She does it she to me. It and I, I she put it in the public. Because <laughs> now bringing up her name, she will, I guarantee you, tweet. Can, well, can I say something I about- I am being harassed by Jason Calacanis because I'm a woman. She's saying that Mark and Dreesen and Andreessen Horowitz blocked her from their clubhouse room. When you're blocked from a clubhouse room, you don't get access. So she said, I'm going to make my own shadow account. She did make a, a puppet account. Now she's listening in. And she got upset at me because I told people in a room, hey, there's a New York Times report in the room. Just be careful because this could wind up in print. She called that harassment and gender-based well, harassment. And, and, and the, the, the thing they're complaining about now is that all of us are trying to go around them and just tell our stories directly. And so they're right. all enraged. They're saying, how dare Mark Andreessen or, you know, A16Z, you know, not talk to us. It's like, well, wh why should they? I mean, you know, my experience with the press has been that about 75% of the time when they ask me for comment on something, it ends up being a hit piece. Um, Maybe not on me, but on some something I care about, and they 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 twist what you say or take one little quote out of context to support the article, and you end up giving credence to an article that you completely disagree with, and so and so all of us have to stop taking those calls. I mean, we just know we just know there's such an agenda behind most of these um, calls that we just like don't take them anymore. Yeah, that's that's why we're going direct. Yeah, I'll say one thing about Taylor Lawrence. I, I've learned a lot because I feel like, you know, being 44, I'm kind of out of the no. Yes. And I've learned a lot because she's, she has her finger she on the pulse. I feel like she, I mean, it's really, it's been really fun reading her, uh, reading her stuff. The other thing I'll say is on the Andreessen thing, I think what they have finally stumbled into, like, I remember when, you know, Andreessen started about a year before I started social capital. And I remember the whole push was, you know, multi services, right? And they were going to be recruiting and sales and this and that. You know, I suspect that all of that was kind of like pretty meager ROI and not that it just burned a ton of fees. But I think this thing that they're doing is really smart because if they effectively build their own distribution arm through newsletters, Substack, podcasts, you know, clubhouse shows, whatever, that's a force to be reckoned with because then if you're a venture investor, you either have to be like them with their own version, in which case the the brand of and Andreessen really matters, or you're on this path of where the trend of venture is already going, which is solo GPs and individual people are the brands. Mm. And there's going to be very little space in the middle. So for example, like I do think that like, you know, the all in podcast helps, for example, David in craft, um, or Jason, you in launch, but you guys oh, the also syndicate is going crazy. But and you guys also stand alone as individuals. Um, but, you know, if you're a traditional firm, you know, pick your organization, which neither has brands nor has distribution. W what are you doing? Well, you're probably forced to just pay the highest price. And so those returns for those folks in the middle get really bad, I think, over time. And uh, you at some point have to decide, are you an individual person? Right. And yes. there's like some amazing up and coming GPs. We know them, Lockie Groom, go folks like that. Yep. Or are you, are you Andreessen Horowitz yep. with this massive distribution? Well, I mean, and now we have to them. just, I think, face the reality that we are in competition. And I think that's what is making the press even more. And that's what makes the situation even more complicated. I'm not saying the press is targeting people they consider competitive, but the press is not getting Vlad, Elon, or Zuck for interviews. But because Mark Andreessen has, you know, Clubhouse now, they put themselves on the suggested follower list. Just like Twitter put Ohm, Kara Swisher, and some other journalists on the suggested follower list for Twitter. What that was, was it was payment, basically, like a million followers. Now Andreessen has a million followers, Balaji, all these folks from Andreessen, I believe, have like a million followers. So the press is complaining about that as well, because they can then dominate them in terms of getting subjects. So they've lost the subjects. None of us get on the phone with the press with very few exceptions. And where is Sway or Vox or Ezra Klein when compared to our podcast, right? Like we're right up there with them, if not ahead of them. I mean, we're the number one tech podcast. So it's, 
it's pretty crazy when you think about how much their world has changed. And now they're directly in competition with Andreessen Horowitz, all in podcast, you totally. know, pick the firm doing a venture thing. And that's going right. to make this even more contentious. I predict. Yes, I, I, I totally ag I agree with that. But I also, I, I do think fundamentally that all of us wouldn't have felt the same need to go around them if right. we didn't feel that there was such a strong agenda. Just to bring what, have you guys heard of gel man amnesia effect? Michael no, Crichton. Tough. Okay. So Michael Crichton, you know, who wrote Jurassic Amazing. Park and it, like a true polymath and genius, right? Yeah. Airframe, um, very good, by the way. I, I mean, know. so many brilliant things. He uh, was even a, a Hollywood director, true multi-talented guy. Anyway, he described the, the gel man amnesia effect as follows. He says, you open the newspaper to an article on some subject you know well. So in this case, it was a physics paper by on gel man. Okay. Um, he oh, says, I do know this. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. He says, he says, you read the article and see the journalist has absolutely no understanding of either the facts or the issues. Often the article is so wrong. It actually presents the story backwards, reversing cause and effect. I call these the wet streets cause rain stories. The paper is full of them. Okay. In any case, you read with exasperation or amusement, the multiple errors in a story. But then you turn the page to some other section to national international affairs, and you read the rest of the paper as if it was somehow more accurate. Totally. Um, you turn the page and forget what you know, which is that the journalist just gets so much wrong. And, and I think, you know, and, and all of us kind of suffer from gel man amnesia sometimes because we still, I think, take when we read something in the paper, we take it at face value. And I think, but we, we all know that when it comes to tech reporting or whatever, there's so much misinformation that get, gets put out by these official channels. And I think at the end of the day, what's happening now with these end run around the traditional media, it's all a response to gel man amnesia. I think it's a problem of complexity. Um, you know, I, I remember years ago, I would, when I was younger, I would read the paper or read um, magazines about uh, science and um, engineering and I was, you know, really interested in these topics. And it was only years later when I actually realized how wrong so many of those articles were as I started to read the original scientific research papers. But it takes a skill set and it takes a significant amount more time to really go into depth into those papers and to actually read them. The same is true, as you point out, with like, you know, geopolitical issues, like the complexity of what goes on. Yeah, um, Here, here's uh, what know, I learned foreign nations. And when I, I was I, a journalist we would have about 10 to 20% of the information about what occurred when we've pu published our first story. And then maybe every subsequent follow up, we get another 10%, which means if we were really hooked into a story, and we did five versions of that story, we might get to 40%, 50% understanding. Whereas when the four of us are doing a deal, and then you see this impact, you, you know, the press is getting it completely wrong. And that was fine. If you felt the press was fair, right? But and Jason, that's I think what's it, happening I, is now there, it, it, there's a distinct feeling with subjects that they're being treated unfairly. And what I do, when somebody connects to me, and they say, Hey, can you comment on Robin or whatever? I said, I can't. But I do have a great story for you about a world positive startup. And I kept doing this with Teddy, who kept asking me to give information on friends of mine, you know, the guy from uh, Recode or whatever, who covers like philanthropy. And every time they contact me, I say, yeah, you know, I can't comment on that, but you can talk to the founder, but I have three world positive stories. Are you interested in any of them? And I just do that kind of to troll them. And they've never in five years taken me up on profiling a world positive. So if the press wants to turn this around, a very simple solution is one for you, one of your hate stories. So if you, for every time you want to take down a company, maybe write about one company that's doing something good. There's some company doing something in carbon sequestering right now yeah. that is super valid and world positive. Write about it. And the only time they write about Tesla is when Elon trips or, you know, something, uh, somebody dies in a car or they write about Uber because of some tragedy. Sorry, I just want to say like, Jason, like just going back a second, like th your point is one about bias, which is, you know, creating sensationalism, sell stories. It's what consumers want to consume sure. um, at the end of the day. So there's certainly, you know, um, a, a market driven model there. The, the point I was trying to make earlier is there's also a separate problem around complexity, which which is complex issues take time and take depth mm -hmm. to truly understand. And so to really understand what's going on in the Middle East or what's going on inside of a company like Facebook requires more than a five paragraph journal article. It requires some hours of conversation and dialogue. And I think, by the way, the craving for that depth, which delivers truth and understanding is what, you know, podcasts can provide and Clubhouse is providing long form content 
that hmm. allows you to go into 100. the nuance and into the texture and into the depth of what's going on in the world, as opposed to having the five paragraph littered with ads, BuzzFeed article that says something sensational, but it simplifies something to the point that it's often wrong or completely misses the real depth of what's going on. And, you know, it's like, and, and I think that, I, I think they're both, they're both, they're both kind of playing into each other. Yeah. And then I want to give a prediction. The, 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 they're both, what you're describing are both issues. And I think they're related in the following sense that if you were to go to like any of these reporters, like the people that J. Cal mentioned a couple of names, okay. If you were to filter their bylines, and see all of their, not, not one story, but look at like all of the headlines for all their stories over, say, the past year. You will definitely see a trend. They will of all, course. they will all have, you know, like negative for, for certain reporters. It'll be a hundred percent negative about tech, zero yeah, percent positive. I mean, Aaron Griffin, I think is the reporter who's one of the top tech reporters at the New York Times. It's just like Coinbase, Coinbase away. Yeah, exactly. So when's the last time they wrote a positive story? So there is this huge agenda there. And, um, and I think it prevents people from getting into the complexity because it's a lot easier to write, you Here's know, the that, prediction. That, and I'm going to make a bold prediction here. The media companies are going to, you know, they're obviously picking a side. They obviously went subscription. Now they're dealing with Substack, Clubhouse, podcasts, all chipping away. I think what's going to happen is you're going to see media brands built around certain podcasts and they're going to work subject first. In other words, the subject of the story are, are going to create media property. So if you look at what we've done with All In, and obviously I have This Week in Startups, if we did the Friedberg on science podcast. And it was just Friedberg explaining a science topic. And then, then we did Chamath on public markets. And then we did Sachs on, you know, alt-right conspiracy theories. And we just had <laughs> five pods <laughs> now. Or, or, or it could be something else. I don't know. Guns. You know, whatever. I don't know. We, pro-life. I don't know what Sachs is into. But you know. What I, no, Sachs could do something on SAS. So Sachs on SAS, Friedberg on science, Chamath on thirst traps. <laughs> this week in startups, <laughs> then we have all in. That's five, five full pods of an hour and a half each. If each of you did your own pod and I have my pod and we made the all in network, the all in news network, I guarantee you we would be within five years, you know, right up there with CNN and MS MSNBC. Well, one thing that Jason and I've Hands been toying with now is um, I really do want to start um, a Twitch channel. And I think part of why is I'd like to really actually have more conversations about you know companies and stocks and with youth, you know, with the youths yeah with the youths and like you know really get into the details and like also when we you know partner with a company bring them on the show so that we can spend an hour or two and talk about things in detail it's totally lost and and the crazy thing that i realized for me is to, you know to your point jason like you know we have enough distribution now where where millions of people can see it and if that has real impact because, you know, you, you can allow people to judge. And I'm not necessarily saying we're better or worse than anybody else, but if we're not using it for, uh, the, per the express purpose of selling ads necessarily and getting paid, I do think there's a better likelihood that it's, that the outcome is better. Well, I mean, a big part of the success of this has been the banning of guests and the banning of ba banning of ads and banning of ads. People really have responded to that. And I think if we put the Twitch channel up and we just throw in all in, throw in this week in startups and then, you know, a Saks, you know, point counterpoint show, and I, I'm being sincere, Freeberg, just Freeberg on science. And, you know, that's five shows. And we just say every Friday, there's going to be five shows like this is your weekend, and we're going to loop it. And there'll be a QA. and a I guarantee you, we could get five other besties to do shows. You know, and we would didn't be he, number isn't this one what, isn't it, Didn't you guys originally like, so for the audience um, that that doesn't know this, originally the All In podcast was uh, Chamath and Jason. They were yes. talking about doing a show together, um, and then COVID hit, and they. Uh, I think you guys asked me on the, the Pod Zero to talk about COVID stuff. Um, but what was the original goal you guys had? You know, Chamath, did, isn't that what you wanted to do originally? Was to have kind of a direct audience and a direct conversation about you know whatever it is you wanted to talk about, where you could have this kind of long form dialogue. Um, you know, what, what did you guys, why did you guys want, want to do it in the first place? I mean, wasn't that kind of the idea? I'll tell you what, what sort of like my general viewpoint is, which is that, um, like we are atomizing our affinity. So I think that like we've gone from believing in institutions and now I, I think we fundamentally mistrust institutions. Then we spent 30 or 40 years believing in companies. And now I think we basically don't believe in companies anymore. 
And now we're sort of at the at the at the bleeding edge of what where belief and trust exist, which is at mm. an individual person level. Ownership. So, ownership. Accountability. So, so so like, you know, I, I and I think that when an individual has the potential to not just be about something for themselves, but also for themes that other people care about, that's when you get real heat. And obviously the most impressive example of that is Elon, because you know, E represents exploration, engineering, science, climate change, you know, uh, memes, all, all of this stuff. Um, <laughs> not really, memes. not really. Uh, I think the other I'm things joking. are really what matters. No. Of um, and so, and so what it shows people is like, I just want to find affinity around a few key people. And what he is, is not the end state. He's the beginning of the beginning, mm. right? So what's going to happen is all of us will say, I don't trust institutions. So whatever they put out is just going to be corpo. I don't yeah. trust companies. What they say is going to be corpo. I'm yep. going to take my best shot at finding folks that I think are real. Yep. Um, and I'm just going to get be that. That's the thing. That's why I wanted 100%. to do this with Jason. Yeah. And then with the four of us, I think what happened almost accidentally is it's like a real plurality of views. And, um, and you don't have to agree with all of us. And frankly, no, no, nobody does. And we don't generally agree 100%. But I think that's what's happening. So I think we're another sm much smaller than Elon, but a, another example of you're going to want to find your own truth tellers, you know, folks that you will get behind. And in, and I think that, you know, business people, that's where they're going to emerge. Because if you look at that first generation of star, right. the Kim Kardashian, the Kanye West of the world, that's arcing. You know, then people went to like the Mr. Beasts and that's still building. So yep. you have the business celebrity building, you have sort of next generation celebrity building. And I think and, that's what's it's going on. Let, let me just ask you guys one question because, you know, I think the, the intention with, with journalists was kind of to be arbiters of the truth or discoverers of fact and to, to deliver that fact um, uh, to their audience. And when you have this direct relationship between the source and the audience as you do through social media and Twitter and whatnot. Um, there, there isn't an arbiter, there isn't a third party. And everything that then is said by the source is taken at face value. How does that play out in a world where, you know, Trump may say things like, hey, there's election fraud, um, when the facts don't line up. And now you have this ability to not have an arbiter. And these people, anyone that now has a direct relationship with a large audience can say anything they want and kind of drive large change without those things necessarily being rooted in some, you know, relative kind of objective um, sense. So Sachs. Well, I mean, I think it's a marketplace of ideas and everybody's competing. And the the answer to bad speech or bad ideas is more speech and better ideas. And yep. um, I mean, that's the reality is it is very frustrating to see you know, people propagating things that aren't true. However, none of us has a monopoly on the truth. We can't say for sure what it is. And so we arrive at the truth through sort of a free marketplace of ideas. Um, there is no better solution than that. You know, there is no magical way to entrust a small elite of people with, you know, the right to censor um, and tell us what the truth is without essentially, you know, creating a worse situation. And, um, you know, that, that's the fundamental problem. So yeah, look, we're, we're, we're gonna, we're, we're going to this era in which, um, there, there, there is no, um, you know, if you go back like 50 years ago, you had Walter Cronkite saying, and that's the way it is. And everyone believed him. And then the New York Times was the paper of record and people believe that. All the that. news and, that's fit to print. Right. Exactly. And so, but that's been steadily eroding for decades. And now the internet is the final erosion of that. And, um, and look, I think, it's not an all it's not a bad thing because in order for journalism to work, you need all the journalists to buy into a certain code of journalistic behavior and ethics, which is all about objectivity. And the press doesn't buy into that anymore. They don't believe in objectivity anymore. No. And especially they gave I'll it tell up, you right? something, Sachs. Young writers I found when we were trying to hire young writers for Inside as an example, they all wanted to write anti Trump, you know pro woke, whatever, they had some ax to grind. And I said, you know, you should really write for an opinion page, but you haven't done any journalism yet. So you should probably do journalism for 10 years. And then in the second decade, you earn the right to be on the opinion page. Let's put in some reps, do 10 years of this. And 
you know, it, it just never uh, actually <laughs> Wait, do you guys hear something? Hey, have you guys oh, seen oh, that movie oh, from oh, from Duff Till oh, Dawn? And there's oh, that oh, moment where the movie just suddenly the scene changes and everything's different? What's that? Oh, is somebody oh, at the... Oh, what's going on? The, that's the we bestie have a, line. Wait, what? Somebody's calling the bestie phone. Did you give the bestie phone number to somebody, Chamath? Oh, oh my God, is somebody... Wait... What's going oh. on? Who's there? You up? You up? <laughs> you up? What's going on? Ellen. Okay, let's see. Is anybody there? Hello? Hello? Whoa! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Draymond Green in the house. Draymond What's up, Green. bestie guesty? Bestie guesty. What's going on, here? besties? What's up, bestie? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Are you in a are you in a uh, coronavirus COVID quarantine somewhere in an NBA bubble? Where are you? <laughs> I am. I'm in. I'm in Dallas, stuck in the hotel with bad water pressure. <laughs> oh, the worst. <laughs> that the is, worst. honestly, that is the thing. If you had to give me the most luxurious hotel in the world, but with a tap, a faucet for water pressure, no <laughs> thanks. I would rather sleep. I would rather sleep in a box. With a great, with a great shower. The water right. pressure is everything. <laughs> everything. All right. On the call, obviously, uh, drafted by the Golden State Warriors in the second round, 35th overall in the 2020 NBA draft, three-time NBA champion, 2016-17 defensive player of the year, two-time NBA all-star, five-time all-defense. Uh, and drafted behind Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, Dion Waters, Harrison Barnes, Tyler Zeller, Miles Plumby, <laughs> and oh I don't know how many people got drafted ahead of you, Draymond, but I know that you can repeat them in order. Is there anybody who's drafted ahead of you who has achieved even a fraction of what you've achieved in the NBA, Draymond? There's 34 guys drafted ahead of me, and I definitely oh. can still name all of them. Uh, <laughs> and saying that, I think there are a few. Um, Anthony Davis. Yeah. He's done okay. He got one ring. Damian Lillard. No rings. Yeah. But a stud, though. Stud. He's very a, good player, but no animal. rings. I'm just saying. Animal. And Bradley Bill. Brad Bill. Okay. Also no rings. Stud. Yeah. Stud. So no rings. I got all the guys in the rings category, but then I don't have Patrick McCall in the rings category. Patrick McCall has the same amount of rings as me. So who? You know. <laughs> Patrick, you know so. <laughs> so, respect to those guys i named respect, although respect. they don't have the rings i got major respect for those guys we were thinking about what to talk to you about uh coming on the pod and we have a series of questions just about being an nba player and what you've learned and how good you've become i just i'll start it off with one question which is it seems like every year you get a little better at something how do you do that do you like say over the summer, I'm just going to be better at my screens. I'm going to be better at X, Y, or Z. Or do you just try to get incrementally better all year long? I mean, you always want to try to get better all year long. But the reality is with this season, with the way, not just this season in particular, an NBA season in general, you don't have much time to get better. So you're kind of just getting better on the fly. And when, when you're in your workouts during the season, you're just trying to maintain because there's such little prep time. But during the off season, you really lock in on a couple of things and try to get better at those things. And, you know, I think I've become a much better ball handler. I think I see the floor much better. I think I've gotten better overall as a player. Um, the one area that I've wanted to see more growth in is my shooting and you know, when I'm shooting a basketball on my own, I know for sure I've gotten better at shooting. Um, like, you know, you come in the gym with me, I shoot the lights out every time. Uh, but it's it's about getting over that mental block in the game. You know, I think that's the thing people don't realize is, you know, I shot the lights out for years in a row. And you know, I had a year where I think I shot 39% from three. But then you go through the struggle. And once you lose it mentally, it's uh -huh. hard to get it back. And so I'm yeah. fighting that challenge now. Although yeah. I know I can make the shot, it's when you get in the game mentally, got to get over that hurdle. What, what do you do? You do like meditation or do you have like a coach who does like positive visualizations or something like that? Or is it just reps and working through a shooting slump? But I've definitely incorporated some meditation on the Calm app. Thank you. Shout out oh, to, shout Jesus out Christ. Jay Dude, yeah. Did you give him all chips? You moron. Raymond, you have you to disclose that shit. On the oh only podcast, God. you have to disclose if you have options. I'm oh shipping the shares right now. Quit your beak and comment. You don't have any shares yet. Okay, good. Uh, 
No shares yet. Hey, Let's Draymond, are, 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 are other players in the NBA struggling right now? I mean, with like COVID over the last year and the shutdown and the fits and starts and everything. I mean, is it kind of tough to get in the game mentally for folks? And is it- It's brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. Um, I, you know, you talk to guys around the league. Um, there's even some guys, and I won't throw anybody under the bus, but and I'm talking about one superstar in particular who I've never seen him out of shape. And he's so out of shape right now. Everybody <laughs> I think we know. Wait, I think yeah. we know. It's no comment. Luke, no comment. James yeah. Hart. Yeah. No, it's, it's not Luke or James Hart. But I've never no. seen this guy out of shape. Um, and he's out of shape right now. And I asked him when he was playing. And he's like, man, the bubble. Like, all, it's just been hard. And I completely understand that. I mean, what? Mates. It's, it's brutal. And <laughs> this season currently, you know, I don't want to sound like um, – just this overprivileged guy who's complaining about uh, being able to make a living because there's so many people who's lost their jobs and, and I don't take you know uh, being able to go to work for granted at all. But this season has been extremely tough. You know, whereas an NBA day normally is like maybe four to six hours. Like every day right now, it's like ten to twelve hours. Wow! And you know, it's COVID testing you. For 11 a.m. practice, we have to be at the facility at 8.45 a.m. Oh, wow. And, and then you have to be back at the facility to test no later than five, in between 4 and 5 p.m. Mm-hmm. And so you, you kind of have these long, drawn-out days, and about maybe two hours of that is actual work time. You know, and then you're just trying to do some recovery things to kill time. You can't leave a hotel. You know, for myself... One thing that I've always found in the NBA season is it's a ton of pressure, obviously, and it's very, very demanding. Like, you can't really do much else. As you guys know, I'm always trying to coordinate with y'all about playing poker around the schedule. You can't really do anything else. But one place that I've found is normally I'll take, like, a day trip to Aspen, you know, or, or do different things like that, a day trip to L.A., to kind of clear your mind and get a release. You don't have those releases now. Mm. You can't take a day trip. Yeah. You can't get away. Even on yeah. off days, you have to go to the facility and test. And so even just seeing that facility that day, although you may not even go in to work out, but you drive into that facility every day, mentally, it's exhausting. And so it's been mm. a very tough season, to say the least. And I think a lot of guys are struggling with it and saying that you know we all want to continue to earn our living it must be, so it must be better to be do what you have to do it must be better to be playing versus being stuck at home with with the, the league shut down right i mean it's got to be better for to be sure out. yeah i mean it's better for all of us obviously uh you know from an economical standpoint we all want to continue to make money uh you know and, and provide for our families we all want to continue to take this lead to new heights. So it's always better uh, for us to be on the court than off. And But that comes with certain challenges, and you just got to deal with those challenges and Day-Day. try to continue to press forward. Dede, before you came on, we were talking about the media, and we are talking about how all these industries used to rely on the media to tell their story, and now all these industries are finding ways to go around them. And it's even happening in venture capital, right? Um, in the business of sports, I found this thing that that I thought was really interesting. Um, Ronaldo signed a one billion dollar lifetime contract, right? I think this is like two or three years insane. But then it turned out that in one year, he generated four hundred and seventy four million dollars of value for Nike just through social media because of the number of followers he had, which I think is just absolutely nuts. Um, what do you think about the media? What do you think about your ability to tell your version of the facts through the media? I think um, we've definitely grown in that area, as you said, in, you know, in all uh, businesses, whether it's basketball, whether it's venture, you know, just all over the board. Everyone has grown in that area and kind of start taking the bull by the horns and try to tell their own narrative. Um, it, you know, if you want me to be quite frank with you, I hate the media. And I be <laughs> so does sex. <laughs> and saying that I could possibly be a part of that group one day. You know, but I hate the media, and the reason I hate the media is I don't hate particular people. You know, I have relationships with a ton of people in media, great people. I hate 
what media entails in today's day and age. You know, yeah. it's all about um, who can stir up the most commotion. What happened with this guy? Uh, what happened with that guy? Um, it's less about, man, this guy is struggling on the floor and more about James Harden was in the club. Yeah. You know, so how much controversy can we stir up about James Harden being in the club as opposed to if we really wanted to talk bad about James Harden when he was on the Houston Rockets, he was bumming it. Now, yeah. we all know James Harden isn't a bomb player, but he was completely dogging it with the Houston Rockets. He's completely turned it up and turned back into James Harden as he's gotten to the Nets. But you can easily, if you want to nitpick at James Harden, talk about James Harden not playing well. But in turn, we're going to talk about James Harden being in the club that night and he was at little baby's birthday party. And although, you know, I, I disagree with some of the things he was doing, why is that all that? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about it's clicks. all about clicks and, and, and selling ad dollars against that. We were just talking about that before you got on. No, look Mark. at look at what happened to Kyrie. In in the span of literally a week, Kyrie had both sides of the same coin. One was he violates the shelter in place or whatever and was like at a birthday party with his family, and then he gets suspended. And on the other side, Kyrie had bought a house for George Floyd's family. Yeah. And so it's like both are true. But you have to go through these two news cycles where first he's just a piece of shit and then he's this amazing philanthropist. What's the point? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree. I don't under, I don't get the point. Like no. and like like Freeberg just said, it's it's all about clicks. Yeah. And I think that's short lived. You know, at, at some point, everyone's going to get tired of your clickbait. And so, yes, it may drive you revenue right now. It may, um, you know, bring more subscribers right now. But in the long term, people are going to get sick of that. At the end of the day, authenticity always wins out. When you create great products, when you give everything great to whatever business that you're giving, that's always going to outlive the bullshit. Yeah, and so yeah. you got and, and that's why you're starting to see so many so much turnover with media people and leaving this job and going to this place and leaving other place because people get sick of that shit. Yeah. And so I feel like all of these guys are driving themselves out. You're constantly you're killing your relationships with players. You're killing your and, and when I say players, I'm not just talking about NBA players. You guys are the players in the venture space. We're yeah. the players in the in the basketball space. You're killing your relationships with the players. So eventually you're just going to be stuck there tweeting out bullshit, <laughs> making bullshit articles <laughs> that no one will co-sign to and then no one wants to fucking hear you anymore. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> oh boy. Looks like we got our bestie in rotation now. Yeah. That's going to get clipped. That's a little rant, a little Draymond rant. <laughs> oh man. Your first bestie rant, uh, Draymond. <laughs> We, we've all we've all had our moments. We've all had Dr our Dr Draymond. Moments. Have you watched or listened to any of this podcast before? <laughs> of course. Are you fucking kidding me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a I have a question actually. So so I, yeah, and I'm not sure if the viewers know because from Jason's introduction that we actually play poker with you, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. Right. That's how I got to know you. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously, it's been a real thrill, and because uh, you're a great guy, and it's also really interesting to get a window into your world. But I'm curious, like, what do you get out of hanging out with us? Are you know yeah. these bunch of these, nerds. these yeah, losers bunch of and <laughs> white nerds? Pariahs. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, you know, and uh, and then you know, maybe use that as a segue to also talk about what you're doing in business these days, because I think that's interesting. What what I get from hanging out with you guys is number one, incredible friends. Um, you know, I think that's what's been the most important thing for me. It's just building friendships that will go far beyond any of you guys doing any deals. It'll go far beyond um, me doing any deals or me playing basketball. And that's the thing that I cherish the most. Um, you know, obviously it started with Bestie C bringing me into the poker game and introducing me to everyone. And then all of you guys welcoming me with open arms. And, you know, I always say in the groups, in our group chats, uh, anytime that there's a debate going on, I make sure to throw my disclaimer out there. Hey, I can't <laughs> talk anything with you guys. I know everyone can talk circles around me, but this is how I feel on said topic. And hey, tell, tell us about the, tell us about the temperature in America. The temperature in America uh, is fucked up. And and I think, you know, where we are today as a country, um, it's no different than where we were 30 years ago, 40 years ago. 
we just live in a day and age of social media where we can see everything. And so the same battle cry that Dr. King was crying uh, 50 years ago, it's still currently going on today. It's the same exact thing, uh, or 60 years ago. It's the same exact things that's, that's taking place today. Yeah. And our country is one, in, in one of the most fucked up spaces it's ever been in. And in saying that, it's in just about the same place that it's always been in. Yeah. And so, you know, we've sugarcoated shit for so long that it seems now like, oh, police killings are at an all-time high of shooting unarmed people. Um, you know, racism is at an all-time high. It's not at an all-time high. It's the same that it's been. Yeah. It's just on the it's it's being pushed to the forefront now, yeah. as opposed to it being on the back burner before. Uh-huh. And so um that's that's just kind of where we are as a country. Um, you know, that's you think, are, you think things are gonna the best I, you think sentiment's gonna shift, Draymond? I mean, you know, the protests that happened in this country over the last year obviously happened during COVID. And um, and I think it magnified them uh, a lot more uh, than, you know, similar protests that have taken place historically. But, you know, are we seeing like sentiment shift in the United States in terms of policy and people's behaviors and and attitudes right now? Uh, I think some people behavior, but I, I don't think anything is going to shift okay. um, in part. And partly because we live in a fake ass world where no one can say anything. You say anything, you get castrated for. You're, I, I think, um, you know, in, in telling your truth, which in order to create the change that we need in America, people have to be able to speak the truth. Yeah. And if you can't speak the truth without getting fucking destroyed and a part of the bullshit cancel culture that we all have to deal with, then how can you ever create change through a lie? Right. lie right. Lies are, is what we've been facing for hundreds of years. But yet when you get in front of a microphone, you have to be very conscious of what you say because it may piss this group of people off or it may piss that group of people off. And then you're never allowed to tell the fucking truth. So how will we ever move forward as a country if no one can tell the truth and you only get canceled? Yeah. So you cancel who tells the truth and we fucking push forward all the lies. We'll never move anywhere as a country. So I don't think we're going anywhere. Seems like in the NBA, we went from the player saying, listen, I don't want to touch that. Michael Jordan was very clear in the last dance. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an athlete. I don't want to talk about politics. I don't want to lose half the audience. And then you had, you know, Melo um, and... Uh, you know, LeBron and a bunch of folks see uh, Chris Paul, I guess, was in that group too. Dwayne Wade, when they came out and said, hey, listen, we got to talk about this and we got to talk about race in America. And then that culminated with the Black Lives Matter um, branding of everything in the bubble and that kind of historic moment. What's the what's what was the vibe inside of the NBA when the player said, listen, this is important to us if we're going to get back on the court. We need to make this front and center. This is our priority. And then you, let's face it, you got a lot of owners in the league, maybe who are old white guys. Maybe they don't want to bring this kind of heat. They don't want this kind of debate. They want to just play ball, shut up and dribble, all this nonsense. What was that moment like when you guys said, no, this is what we have to do if we're going to get back on the court? I think I think guys have just had enough. And more, most importantly, I think um, now more than ever, guys truly understand the power of the athlete you know in the, in the exactly closing the, the loop on what we just said you, you we control the narrative you control the narrative the absolutely and and so we're, we're just kind of in a space where we understand this ship don't sail without us and the things that matter to us has to matter to the league now right and saying that i think uh we have a commissioner that supports everything we stand for. And when you have a commissioner like Adam Silver, who is in full support of everything that the players stand for, is never trying to fight us, is never trying to put a muzzle on us and tell us not to stand up for what we believe in, that that's a very powerful thing. And that's why the NBA is the most powerful sports league in the world, because we have a commissioner who's on board and who not only supports what the players think and what we believe in, but he takes it even a step further, you know, yeah. and, and you don't see that. You, you see the NFL tell guys, you have to stand, you know, or, or stay in the locker room. 
Adam Silver don't do us don't do that to us. What and that's I, why there's always friction between their commissioner and their players. David, what did you think about the storm the Capitol when you were watching that? What was going through your mind? We we see the two different sides of America. The first thing that went through my mind was I wonder if that was a Black Lives Matter protest uh, or or Black Lives Matter protest was stormed in the Capitol, how much of a bloodbath it would have been. It would have been one of the biggest bloodbaths in, in American history, you know. 100%. And uh, and and so immediately when I saw it, the first thing I thought of was like, "Wow, how how is this even happening?" Like, and let alone it, it not happening. No one. And, and by the way, I don't wish death on anyone, but oh, yeah. I know that if those were melanated people storming into the Capitol building, it would have been bloodshed everywhere. They would have unloaded to, facts. Absolutely. And so it just kind of um, really, once again, just revealed how there's two sides of America. And as I said before, until we tell the truth about it, we'll still, we'll continue to live in the day and age where there'll be two hey, sides of America. Draymond, when, when COVID first started and we went into lockdown and we were all texting with each other talking about like how crazy the world had become. One of the things that stuck with me and still sticks with me is the comments you made over our text chain about how it feels like you felt growing up. Can you just explain what you meant by that and like just share that with our audience that's listening? Because it was such a striking comment. We were all like, oh my gosh, like I can't go outside. I can't like go to the store. Like this this world is crazy. And you were like, this is what it was like. And it was just such a striking, maybe you can just share a little bit about what you meant by that. Because I think it paints a little bit of a picture uh, you know, for folks to understand a little bit about, you know, kind of, you know, what America can be like and what it's like growing up in in, in parts of the U.S. Well, number one, I, I want to point out that I told all of y'all the first day we went into lockdown, we all should go to Cabo and no one listened to me. Uh, <laughs> that was a good call. So, it was a good I, call. You were right. <laughs> we should all go where to Cabo. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but um, when, when I said that in the group chat, uh, what I said, what I said in the group chat was, Honestly, I was in my condo in San Francisco. I live in a high, high rise, great view of the Bay Bridge, great view of the water. You see all of San Francisco, South San Francisco, everywhere. And, and I said to the group chat, after a few weeks of lockdown, I said this, you know, guys, I have to be quite frank with you. This feels no different than me growing up in Saginaw, Michigan. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I mean by that, I said, this feels no different than me growing up in Saginaw, Michigan. The only difference is I know where my next I know where my next meal is coming from. Yeah. You know, and I'm am I'm, I'm in a much better place, living space than I was. But this feels no different. Where I'm locked in, I can't go anywhere. That was me growing up in Saginaw, Michigan. Locked in, couldn't go anywhere, didn't know that there was a world that existed outside of Saginaw, Michigan. And basketball was able to take me different places. But I, I didn't know anything existed and nothing seemed accessible to a young black kid growing up in Saginaw, Michigan. So right. once I was once I was then locked in the house along with everyone else in the world, it just took me back to a space of wow. Nothing else is, is, is accessible to me. This was exactly what it was when I was growing up as a 10-year-old. Like, nothing was accessible to us. We didn't have anything. Yeah. That's how. And so when we went into lockdown, like, I felt right at home. I felt like the kid growing up in Saginaw again. Nothing was accessible to me. But it's such a poignant point, Draymond, because so many people don't, you know, People don't have that experience, but hearing you say that, it provides perspective that there are people living that today. Um, and it's not just about a COVID lockdown, but it's about a different world um, that we don't get to see. So I really appreciated you sharing that. I, I, it honestly was very poignant and, and kind of struck a nerve with me when you said it. Absolutely. I think, you know, one, one thing, I, another thing I said in the chat, and I am included, we, we all got, got a chance to see what it felt like to be those people you know yeah. obviously right. i lived that life growing up but once you remove from it you remove from it right yeah. like i you know you try not to never forget but let's let's be frank you know Shamab, Shamab, you you grew up with nothing uh coming from india and or sri lanka and going to canada you had nothing you understand and you know we all understand from a different perspective but there are still people currently 
that live that live that life today. Can and I tell you all of us a glimpse of what those people go through on a daily basis? The one the one thing about this pandemic is that I've had these moments day where like I actually now am a little bit more connected to my past. I did this um I did this podcast with this guy Patrick O'Shaughnessy and he ends every podcast and he says, you know, uh what is the kindest thing that some somebody's done to you? And I had push this memory down into the fucking recesses of my mind, except in this last year, I've remembered all these kindnesses because I've, I've now, I've, I've, these are the moments where I felt the most insecure. And I, and I told the story about this kid who, you know, when I was like 11 or 12, he was eight. So he was in my sister's class and their family gave us a mattress, two mattresses and some clothes, you know, some plates and like a frying pan and a pot literally, when we got refugee status. And when I said it on the thing, I started bawling. And then I kind of collected myself. And I'm then I'm getting a little verklempt even hearing well, you talk about then, it, man. Well, and the next the next morning, uh, Nat said, how did it go? And I told her, and I exploded and I was crying and crying and crying and crying. And to your point, like, it is so easy to forget where you come from, but it's also easy to forget that there's an, a simple fucking externality. In this case, it's a it's a virus you can't see that gets trans, and it makes us all the same in one mm -hmm. fell soup in one nanosecond. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't make you sort of like empathetic to everybody, not nothing will. But that's one silver lining in this whole fucking debacle. Is it's an opportunity for 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 a lot of folks to reconnect with their own self, you know, and be a better person. Absolutely. There's something Absolutely. you you paused on, Draymond, during the pandemic when you weren't playing, and you guys obviously, uh, with the injuries and everything, didn't you weren't in the bubble, so you had a lot of time to be with yourself. Did you have any, like, during this great pause, you know, I don't know, revelations about yourself, your career, and what you want to do in the second half of your career? Because let's be honest, I mean, the run the Warriors has had has been transcendent. I mean, you guys have checked off every box. You personally have checked off every box, especially for a guy who was drafted in the second round to be a champion and like the way you've developed and the leadership. I mean, everybody in the league knows when you're on the court, that's the team and you have that leadership, the ability to see the floor and direct the offense, direct the defense. Did you come up with anything where you said, this is what I want out of the future of my life? Because we saw you dabble with, you know, TNT and the desk and you killed it. We, we've seen you mic'd up. We see you coaching now. It seems like there's a 2.0 Draymond, like maybe a little evolution here of your thinking about maybe the third act and the second half of your NBA career on the court. Uh, you know, I had a lot of time to really sit and reflect. Uh, you know, I grew a lot in my personal relationships, which I think was important. Um, you know, I, and I think I also grew, grew a lot as, as a business professional as well. Mm. Um, and speaking of, uh, you know, the, the TNT stuff. Uh, that was, I think, you know, we've kind of always, or I've kind of always heard, like, man, when you when you finish playing, you'll have a great career in TV. But the reality is, is you know, we, we've seen some players, uh, you know, that were really good players get up there and not be very, you know, be very good sitting at the desk or, or you know, um, color commentating the game. And, and so it's not as easy as yep. most people think it is. People think just because you play basketball, A, that you know basketball, and then B, that you're going to help, you, you're going to be able to translate or, or help give everyone else an understanding of what exactly it is that you see. Mm -hmm. and, and so – Getting up there and actually being able to do it and then the reception that I got, which was people, you know, in, in my mind, I've always said, I want to be Tony Romo of the NBA. Tony Romo is one of my favorite people to watch do color commentary because – he makes it very simple for you to understand. He tell you, I'm Tony Romo sit there and call the plays out that a team is about to run just by seeing the formation. And they do exactly what he said they're about to do. It's the most incredible thing. And, and speaking of which we were talking about earlier, which was the media, 
one of the things that pissed me off most about the game of basketball today is I can't turn on a sports talk show and actually learn about basketball. And that mm-hmm. fucking pisses me off. All I can turn on a talk show about is hear about bullshit. But the reality is we have, like, we have so many people talking and, uh, and speaking about the game of basketball that don't know shit. Right. And so you, you can't turn on the TV and learn. And so the one thing I'll say I want to bring to that world is I want to be able to teach the game of basketball and then for people to then contact me once I was sitting up there at the desk uh, and inside on inside the NBA and doing all of these different things to contact me and say, the way you break the game down makes it so easy to understand. That was a huge win for me. And it gave me a lot of hope to want to succeed more in that area. Well, I, I'll, I'll say something different. Um, which is what I see is like just a, in just an incredibly beautiful human being because like you're able to humanize that, but then you can go and speak on these other things. That's actually what we need more of because all of a sudden now it's very hard to put people in a box and it shows that we are all multifaceted. It's just that sometimes we don't get the exposure, meaning like I would say I have different facets of my personality because we've been friends for so long. And that's a gift you gave to me. You just said being in that group chat with us, which can be a cacophonous fucking mess sometimes. <laughs> that group chat should that group chat can never, never get out never, of the never to be published. Never to <laughs> be published. Never to be published that group chat. Signal. But but the point is like and this is goes back to this first thing. Like we can now really like be authentic and show all these different facets of ourselves. And it's just like to me, that's what's really important. Because then people see that there is more than, you know, like, like the, the, the most, the best rebuttal to like that whole shut up and dribble, which was so fucking offensive is literally for you to be great at basketball, great at broadcasting, great business. as a, you know, social, you know, person who can comment on the social times of our moment, great businessman. And then I'm just going to put one thing out there right now. Eventually, great fucking politician, because this mm. is like now you want to talk about go. somebody. No, Uh-oh. but you want to talk about somebody who can galvanize interest. And there's an leader? open uh, governor uh, um, yeah. election <laughs> coming up, Draymond, and someone uh, someone on our podcast no longer running, apparently. So, guys, yeah. guys, I'm going to I'm going to make a prediction <laughs> yeah. that our bestie will mm. be the governor of Michigan or the governor of California. Love before, it. Before before the time he's 50. Love it. There you go. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Maybe, uh, I mean, I, you know, I love the state of Michigan. That's home, uh, you know, and, but I, I think California will be home for me for the rest of my life. So yeah. possibly California. Re- recall you some. <laughs> hey, Draymond, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, you're, uh, you're on Twitter, I understand. You have a Twitter handle. Sometimes you check it out. Did you see Chamath's Shirtless. Picture with his shirt off. <laughs> and did, did, you, did block- you see the thirst trap? Did you see it? Tell the truth. Block him after Tell that. the truth. I mean, he looked away. If we all know Shamaf, I'm sure he probably sent it to the fucking group chat. Oh, you must. <laughs> he sent the outtakes. Everybody want, yeah. fuck, want all of us to say, hey, Shamaf, yeah. you look fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely yeah. saw the picture. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 I'm the one who posted it to the, to the group chat. No, that's, that's posted it. <laughs> and I, my chat. comment... My comment, my comment was Chamath Kardashian question mark. <laughs> <laughs> because you put you put the camera in front of your face. You were like you, you the, it looked like this. It was like yeah. you did this thing like well, that. Cool. that Day Day taught me how to do this. He's the oh, wait, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, whoa, stop that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop that. That. That's a no. Okay, zone. guys, listen. We Take are we are we're nearing the end of our podcast. Jason, uh, do you want to tell Day Day what we're gonna do? Okay, so uh, some people have given some reviews or just feedback on the pod, on the besties, maybe even you, Draymond. And so we thought it would be incredibly uncomfortable uh, and funny for us to read some of these. So, uh, Sax, why don't you kick us off with one? The, well, there's a really good pie chart here, which um, Nick, Nick can show, which shows all in pod talk time. And it's basically <laughs> mostly Chamath and then Jason with with both Davids filling like a tiny little piece. And then so it's one third, the majority it's of it is Chamath and Jason talking over each other as like half the pot. Um, bored Elon Musk posted that, I guess. Yeah. Um, All right, well, here's one from Brooklyn yeah. Gal 212 on Sachs. One star review. Sachs, go ahead and read this one star review from Brooklyn Gal 212. 
Yeah, she says that David Sachs ruins every conversation on this call. <laughs> period. <laughs> you forgot the period. All right. Here's one about Chamath. Uh, hey, Chamath. This is one Chimoth, about Yeah, Chamath, read this one. Okay. Uh, it's from Howard Axel Roark. Um, okay. With a every, pill. Okay, with a, with a pill. It says, every time Chamath does something to make me like him, he does two things <laughs> to make me hate his guts. <laughs> okay, go I fuck think we yourself. can all relate to that one. <laughs> And it sounds like me and my playing career. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone fucking hates me, man. It's crazy. <laughs> Draymond, I will tell you when when I first when I first thought about putting a tweet out for like the first time, you were the one who said, "Man, everyone's gonna talk shit, but forget the haters." Like that's just the way it goes when you start. Oh yeah, fuck them. Over. Yeah, fuck the haters. Yeah. All right, here's one Absolutely. for this is a a super fan. Aaron sent this one in to the uh, email. Jason. At this point, I fully believe you have bought, laminated, and framed Kathy Griffin's severed trunk in that picture. <laughs> How many gallons of semen spilled onto it when Biden was inaugurated? Oh, my Lord. Oh, too much. If Twitter offered two blue chuck marks, you'd have three. Your zealotry has made even Bill Maher blush and the other besties cringe when you can't take even a slight ribbing. It's so bad now. The besties have started their own side chat without you. <laughs> At your funeral, the besties will show up not out of respect for you, but for your family. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Oh my God. <laughs> Signed, Jacqueline Sachs. No comment here, <laughs> dude. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Okay, Let's David, here's yours. Yours is up, David. Oh, wait, wait. I need to do this hot take. Hot take. Ready? <laughs> the hot take. Hot takes. Not deeply researched. Three stars. Jason and Chamath make good points, but the other two are <laughs> such whiny nerds. <laughs> One of whom is clearly right wing, wannabe vanilla ISIS. <laughs> Jesus. Oh my lord. So Did he brutal. just call you a terrorist? Oh <laughs> my lord. I think uh I think he's referring to Freeberg. That can't be me. <laughs> Which David? Definitely not me. Definitely yeah, not me. They both have the same. <laughs> oh, here's it. Jason, you want to read the next one? This is incredible. Evil Jason. Evil Jason. Okay, here we go. This is from Adam Keem. He posted this on January 30th, so not long ago. He gives me a full one star, which I think one star <laughs> is like number one, right? Five stars is fifth place. First star is one place. Jason Calacan is, is a monster. <laughs> Monster, wow. not monster. Monster, monster. monster. <laughs> wow. After listening to Jason on the latest podcast, I am floored, period. His personal tax and his complete support of the manipulators in our market should tell you something. This guy is evil. Uh, <laughs> let's move Thanks, on. Thanks, mom. David is trash. That is all. <laughs> Which David? Freeberg. Always yeah, Freeberg. Always Freeberg. <laughs> oh, no. Here, here's, here's one I'll read. If Metro Mile and or becoming new head of USA vaccination doesn't work out for David Friedberg, he could still have an amazing career as a Kermit the Frog voice actor. <laughs> <laughs> Fucker. Um, oh, hey, here's, uh, here's Marcus Aurelius, A1336756, saying to me, Snop. Sniffing your own farts. Mm. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> right. It means that you are so enamored with yourself, Chama, <laughs> that you think your farts are fragrant. Oh my god. All right. Okay, I'm gonna read I'm gonna read a Draymond Green mean tweet. Oh, there you go. Oh no. Draymond Green shoot like he's sitting down in a chair. Fuck yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god read the wow. next one read the next <laughs> one oh, oh, man. Man. these are screens oh, really this is from Sh sugar lump lump sugar <laughs> with an a sugar lump lump sugar lump lump draymond green is so attractive to to me i don't know why because he's legally <laughs> ugly <laughs> <laughs> wait a second uh, did she neg you i think she's trying to slide into the uh, dms and negging you at that's the same a trap. time that's you know the trap. brutal by the way There's the brutal trap. thing about that the way the you brutal thing on, about sugar. that the brutal come thing on, about sugar. that <laughs> is is not not one sent to me she's like Man, Draymond Green is really attractive. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I said, I am so much better looking than Draymond Green. He'll She's never like, get over that, Draymond. He'll oh, still talk about that for years. Yeah, he'll never get over that. It's yeah. been a You're year. I'm still tilted. Sevens. Let's not yeah. get crazy, okay? Right. You're solid uh, sevens on a podcast full of fives. Take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, day Day, read uh, Gold Bluffs Gus. Gold this Bluffs Gus. Draymond Green still <laughs> shoots like he got the door to his floor back. Brutal. We invite Draymond. We invite Draymond on this nice podcast. Don't even tell him. Have him roast himself. This is. He's never coming back.
Go to the bluffs, but guts. Those thoughts are yeah. going in, buddy. Oh my god, this is just—it's so hard. It's so hardcore. Oh my god, that was All really right. fun. To, Draymond, that was really fun to have you on. Thanks yeah, for coming thank on. you. I appreciate it. Thank Besties, you, I love you guys. I love, love all you, of you. Eddie, I love you. Hold on, wait, hold on, wait. I also hold appreciate up. you. You fucking nerds for not talking circles around around me on this podcast. Leave that for the chat. All right. Thank love you, you big boy. All right. I love yeah, you. I appreciate you, Draymond. Love, 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 love you guys. No doubt. Love you, besties. I love you, besties. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sack. And it said we open source it to the fans and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West. Ice Queen of Kinwa. Feet. Feet. What? <laughs> we need to get merch. Are I'm back. going on.